so let me do the welcome i am dr saju kvai head of the department of physics christ college autonomous irnyala kuda uh, my i am uh, shortly introduced i will shortly introduce dr manoj puramangara today's resource person and before that i welcome our principal reverend father dr joli andrews cmi who is who belongs to physics department itself and is very active and uh, encouraging in organizing the webinar series which is in connected with the diamond jubilee of the department of physics christ college irinyalakuda on behalf of all of you present in this webinar i welcome father today the president of the meeting reverend father dr jolly andrew cmi welcome father thank you thank you sir now i will uh, introduce uh, today's topic and uh, resource person uh, dr manoj pravangara now is a faculty member at the department of astronomy and astrophysics tifr tata institute of fundamental research mumbai he did his phd from iia indian institute of astrophysics bangalore and did the several post docs uh, one from ayuka inter university uh, center for astronomy and astrophysics pune then academia sinica institute for astronomy and astrophysics taipei taiwan and uh, university of rochester new york usa his main interest is in the field of star and planet formation and uh, exoplanets exoplanets means extra solar planets we know uh, we have eight planets in the solar system pluto is out now so similar to the solar planets extra solar means the planets around uh, outside the solar system that is around uh, other stars in the universe so that is a very interesting field and uh, it is uh, one of my favorite topic also i am more interested in habitable extra solar planets because uh, after the death of sun sun is an ordinary star so after the death of sun uh, what happens to the life in the universe so in order to continue life in the universe the discovery of such habitable exoplanets are very important so today's one of the thrust area in astrophysics is to detect such exoplanets as well as habitable exoplanets and today dr manoj is going to speak about how to detect the exoplanets which are very far away from us it is uh, very far away so he will explain the techniques how to find these distant extra solar planets he all, uh, also interested in the mechanisms and the physical processes that convert molecular gas in our galaxy into stars and planets how these stars and planets are formed he is also actively involved in building the ir infrared for infrared instruments for ground and space based telescopes in india and dr manoj is a very good friend of mine 
and uh, on behalf of everybody present in the in this webinar and on behalf of Christ College Irinyalakuda and the Department of Physics, I welcome Dr. Manoj Parvangara into this webinar. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shaju. Now I, I welcome uh, the coordinator, the convener of this program, Dr. Sudhir Sebastian. He is a faculty from our own department and he is a PhD guide in solar cells guiding for students and he is hosting this program and uh, I welcome Dr. Sudhir Sebastian. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Now I welcome all the participants of this webinar. We are uh, doing a webinar series and this is the third one. Uh, and uh, I am not uh, taking any time. So I welcome all the participants of the webinar and uh, try to interact maximum with uh, Dr. Manoj. He is a very nice person. He is ready to serve the society, mainly the academic community. Uh, he offered uh, uh, that even if the students are ready to do hard work, he, uh, students can approach him to do the projects works during their MSc. So <clears throat> I ask all the participants to interact thoroughly with Dr. Manoj now or later and take the maximum advantage of this webinar. And I welcome all the participants to the seminar. Welcome to you. Welcome to you all. Okay. Now, <clears throat> our principal, Dr. Father Jolie Andrews, will do the presidential speech. Father, over to you. Okay. Thank you. Am I, uh, is it, am I audible to all? Yes, yes. You may raise the volume. I think volume can. Yeah, volume is less. Okay, I will speak a little bit loud. Okay. okay. I am uh, very happy to have to speak a few words in the webinar series that has been organized by the Department of Physics. And I'm very happy to note that I am also a student of this Department of Physics and I present is a faculty in this Department of Physics. Here, we are, I would like to mention a few words about our college, Christ College. The Christ College was started in 1956 by the Devamada province of the Carmelites of Nelly Immaculate. It is an indigenous uh, religious congregation founded in 1831 by Senchavra, who himself, who himself was a saintly priest and a versatile genius. Now, the Christ College has as its motto, Jeevita Prabha, which means the light of life. Now, Christ College is a part of the century or the tradition of CMI education, which offers an ideal vision of education that is aware of and of responsive to the challenges of the nation's present situation. College has become one of the prominent epicenters of the academic training in the country, thanks to the visionary leadership given to it by its first principal, Padma Bhushan, Father Gabriel. At present, College has 27 UG programs, 16 PG programs, and 11 departments have a research guide in our college. College also offers 21 certification programs. And now I would like to say that at present there are around 3,860 students in college, perhaps the largest number of students in Kerala. College is also entered into MOUs with the University of Tululand, South Africa, Leibniz Institute for Applied Geophysics, Germany, which presents the students with an international exposure opportunity. Now, in the
in the recent facebook uh, facebook feedback and the survey that has been conducted by the alumni in uh, dubai i am very happy to note that the college has been selected as the best campus a campus which everyone enjoys so here as a part of the diamond jubilee a department as a part of the diamond jubilee is on organizing a series of the webinar and this is the third one i would like to say it has been 25 years now our msc program has also been started apart from the uh, starting of the department 60 years back and now this is the 10th year of the establishment of our research center in the christ college in this occasion i'm happy to say that uh, i'm happy to remember with all and with a due respect the giants who have worked hard in order to make our department with such great legacy i would especially remember of pa paul our professor pa paul our first hod and all those who have toiled hard in order to make our department one of the best in perhaps the national scenario now i remember especially our retired staff members both teaching and non teaching staff members who are also worked very hard and a word about our research center where we can say within the 10 years we have really flowered as far as the research has been concerned we are having research in different types of the field including metal materials to the superconductors in solar cells and a variety of our disciples disciplines and we have also started to produce our phd's and recently we have in this year itself have got five phd's that has been defended in the university of calicut i'm very happy to remember uh, the number of publications has now around uh, crossed around within this span of 10 years more than around 170 so in this special occasion i will remember all the uh, teachers who have interestingly taken up on the research also another wonderful aspect that they have done is our pack our alumni association which was formally started this year and i would especially remember with gratitude our vice principal and the hod dr k y shaju who has taken all the initiative for starting this pack and raised a fund and we have also renovating as a part of the jubilee celebration our lab now we have got a lot many hosts as our lot many prominent members of as our alumni also i also remember them in this special occasion now i am very happy to note today's webinar we are uh, having uh, one of the very very interesting aspects very interesting aspects which will be uh, discovered here by dr manoj uh, puravankara he himself from the tifr a very interesting topic regarding the exoplanet the planets outside our solar system definitely this will be a very interesting uh, seminar for all of you international webinar for all of you and uh, the 25 years of this exo ex exoplanet uh, brief history he will be wonderfully presenting here i would welcome everyone to enjoy this webinar so as a result of this they are genuine interest in knowing more and more about our universe may be enhanced a lot i appreciate everyone for this webinar the host is our dr sudhir sebastian he is also i think the convener of the uh, seminar the technical convener of the uh, seminar or of our webinar today and everyone of the department i especially appreciate for having this uh, diamond jubilee webinar series may god bless you all have a wonderful day enjoy the exoplanet thank you thank you father thank you father for your uh, encouraging words now over to manoj dr manoj please uh <clears throat> thank you shaju uh, and uh, and hello and good morning to all of you uh, can you can you hear me am i audible yeah yeah audible excellent good uh, uh well <clears throat> i'm thankful to shaju Uh, Sudhir and uh, and, and uh, Father Jolly Andrews 
for inviting me to give this talk. And, and I, I must say, I'm really happy to be here uh, sharing with you some of the uh, new results and exciting new results in the field of uh, exoplanets. Uh, now, <clears throat> I also understand that this is part of uh, the Diamond Jubilee webinar series, and, and uh, it's, uh, uh, I'm really honored uh, to be uh, invited. Uh, having said that, let me uh, uh, directly uh, go into my talk. So I need to sh share my... Uh, um, yeah, it's visible. Uh, can you can uh, you see this? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. excellent, excellent. Yeah. So let me. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. So the title of my talk today uh, is "25 Years of Exoplanets: A Brief History." Now, uh, before I uh, go any further, let me explain some of the terms uh, in this title. Uh, for example, what are exoplanets, and uh, what's the significance of 25 years? Exoplanets are planets orbiting stars other than the sun. Malayalathile Suryadara grahangal alengile Bahir grahangal dvarin. The first such planet was discovered around uh, a, a star other than the sun, normal main sequence star other than the sun, in 1995. Uh, so it has been 25 years now. So that's the significance of 25 years. Uh, so this uh, sort of uh, sets the context for the talk. So until about 1999, uh, uh, somebody is annotating on the, okay, yeah, all right. Uh, so until about 1999, the only planetary system that we knew of uh, was our solar system, right? Uh, but 25 years later, as of now, today, we know of 4,000 such exoplanetary systems meaning planetary systems orbiting stars other than the sun. Uh, I have tried to capture this in this plot, in this figure that I've shown here. Can you see my cursor, mouse cursor? Can you see this? Yeah, yeah. Please. Okay, yeah. So I've, I've tried to capture this in this figure. Uh, on the x-axis or the horizontal axis, what I have is the orbital distance of planets from the host star, the star that they are orbiting. Uh, and on the y-axis, and, and this orbital distance <coughs> is given in the units of uh, astronomical units. One astronomical unit is the distance from the sun to earth. Uh, and, and on the y-axis, vertical axis, I have planet mass in the units of earth masses. Uh, so you can see earth here. I've also shown the solar system, eight solar system planets here. Uh, earth is at one AU, one astronomical unit, and it has one earth mass, of course. And Saturn is around 100 uh, Earth mass, Jupiter around 300 Earth mass, uh, <clears throat> and, and Jupiter is at 5 AU, right? So in 1995, this was the situation, right? You knew all the eight solar system planets, and, and this was the first exoplanet discovered, right, in 1995. And you can see now the situation has dramatically changed. <coughs> Uh, now we know of uh, more than 4,000 exoplanets. And, and all, all this I've shown here. Uh, forget the colors for the time being. Uh, they uh, represent or correspond to different detection techniques that we have used to discover them. Uh, for the time being, just look at them and where they are located in this plane. <coughs> you see a lot of them uh, are within the orbit of Mercury, They're very close to their host star right here and and and, and you have a, uh, you have earth like planets mass similar to that of earth uh, and also a lot of uh, massive gas giants right mass similar to that of jupiter and also notice that there are a bunch of planets jupiter like massive planets which are at significantly uh, away from their host stars so these systems are uh, you know 30 to 40 times the distance of uh, so our solar system is only about 30 AU in extent. Uh, Neptune is at 30 AU. Beyond Neptune, we have um, rocks and other rocky materials, but that's about the extent of solar system. But some of these planets that you can see here are at two, uh, several hundreds of astronomical units. So, so we have discovered more than 4,000 such systems, and, uh, and, and they are very diverse in their architecture and, and the properties, measured properties of exoplanets. 
and and what i want, what i will do in this talk is to tell you <clears throat> how we have discovered them how we have discovered all these 4000 odd exoplanets and uh, and and what we have learned from them so far in the last 25 years all right uh, here is a rough uh, plan of the talk i will start with the discovery itself and then uh, i will uh, talk about the technical challenges involved in the discovery uh, uh, and 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 the impact that discovery has made i will then uh, describe to you uh, some of the detection techniques that we use to detect these exoplanets and 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 then provide you with the current census of you know how many such systems we know and then its diversity etc and finally i will summarize uh, some of the major results some of in terms of what we have learned so far from this more than 4000 exoplanetary systems that we have uh, discovered so i'll start with the discovery itself uh so as you all probably know uh, the this the first exosolar planet was discovered in 1995 by two swiss astronomers uh, michel meyer and didier culos uh and they were awarded the nobel prize for physics last year for this discovery and the nobel prize citation itself uh, was for the discovery of an exoplanet orbiting a solar type star notice that the 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 keyword here is an exoplanet orbiting a solar type star and this is because the first exoplanet discovered uh, was not around the sun like star it was actually around a dead star uh, which we astronomers call neutron star or or a pulsar uh, but it turned out that uh, planetary systems are not very frequent around such dead stars anyway so i just mentioned it for completeness but this was the first discovery of an exoplanet around a sun like star and they were awarded the nobel prize now how did they discover uh, this planet they discovered this planet using a technique called radial velocity technique and let me explain to you what that is uh, through this video see uh, as you know the star and the planet the, the planet goes around the star but uh, so let me uh, pull it back a little bit see when the when the planet goes around the star so you you would have uh, studied in your basic newtonian mechanics uh basic gravity that it's not that the planet is going around the star but star and planet both are going around the center of mass of the system right that is how the two body thing works so star is also going around the planet is moving around the star but star is also going around the center of mass so this motion of the star can be made use of to detect the planet see planet itself is not very bright we cannot detect them using even the most powerful telescopes in the world but star Uh, we can detect so what we do let me play this video again uh, so the star is move, go, uh, moving away from you and coming towards you moving away you can see the motion right if you obtain the spectra of the star disperse the light from the star using a prism or a diffraction grating you can individually resolve the lines corresponding to elements like hydrogen helium or you know heavy iron magnesium uh, in the photosphere of the star and when the star is moving away from you and to coming towards you these lines will do, uh, do doppler shift you you probably have learned about doppler shift right the source itself is moving with respect to the observer the emitted lines will blue shift and red shift and that is exactly what is happening here uh, so this is the so so when star is going away from you now the lines are red shifted now wait 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 the star is coming towards you now the lines are blue shifted so this is what uh, uh, michael mayer and didier colas employed th this technique so this doppler shift is defined as uh, the observed wavelength minus the the rest wavelength the lab wavelength divided by the rest wavelength and it's also equal to the uh, the velocity the radial velocity divided by c so this we can measure and i've shown the same thing here here the observer is at the bottom of the uh, uh, page so you see the star now the star is going away from you so that's when you get the maximum velocity when the star is now you see star is going away from the maximum red shifted coming towards you maximally blue shifted and you see the lines the different lines of elements moving back and forth when the star is going around and if you can measure the movement of these lines and convert them using this formula to velocities then you can uh, uh, construct a radial velocity curve like this and this is exactly what michel mayer and didier colas did in 1995 nature they published this and they 
they measured this periodic movement of the star and uh, and they derived from this they derived the mass of the star they found that uh, the, the there is a half a jupiter mass star uh, so it's half a jupiter mass planet orbiting uh, a star called 51 pegasi at an orbital distance of uh, 0.05 astronomical unit uh, and uh, so once you measure this radial velocity curve uh, you you can uh, from the observation radial velocity observation, you can measure the the period of the curves right from the time from here to here is the period and you can also measure what is called the uh, radial velocity semi amplitude uh, that is the distance that is the velocity the amplitude from here to here that is what is k as i have shown you once you know the value of k and the period you can measure the mass of the planet and that is exactly what they have done so radial velocity technique this particular technique where you measure the movement of the stellar lines in your spectrum and and then construct the radial velocity curve like this and measure the period of the uh, star or the planet and, and then the, uh, the radial velocity semi amplitude you can measure the mass of the planet so this is how the first exosolar planet was discovered now let us look at what is this uh, semi amplitude the magnitude of this uh, semi amplitude k see for a for a jupiter like planet around sun uh, jupiter is at 5 astronomical units from the sun it will produce a radial velocity semi amplitude of 12 meter per second in velocity radial velocity the radial velocity shift will be 12 meter per second see earth is a uh, much less massive than the uh, than jupiter uh, it will only produce a very small radial velocity shift that is only only 9 cm per second uh see i i i'm i'm uh, telling you this to sort of impress upon you how difficult technically how challenging this discovery was in fact the nobel prize was awarded to this discovery not because of the new physics that is see this the basic physics is known right i mean so you you learn it in your uh, you know 8th uh, to 9th standard textbook how a planet goes around the sun how newtonian gravity can entirely completely describe the motion but but detecting such small uh, shifts the uh, velocity shifts are difficult and that is what i am trying to uh, explain to you and 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 it is to it is for overcoming this technical challenge that this discovery was uh, awarded the nobel prize to measure to detect a planet like jupiter around sun uh, to measure a, a radial velocity semi amplitude of 12 meter per second basically the motion of the lines you need to have a, to have a robust uh, radial velocity curve you need to have a radial velocity precision of 2 to 3 meter per second now the standard spectrograph i hope some of you the masters and bachelor students some you you know how spectrographs work you would have done some spectroscopic experiment in your lab the spectrographs uh, the the spectral resolution is or the spectral resolving power is normally defined by a quantity called r the resolving power which is the ratio of the wavelength the reference wavelength to that of the uh, the velocity the wavelength resolution uh, typically the for astronomical spectrographs that's about 50000 and that corresponds to at the optical wavelengths visible wavelength like the 6000 angstrom or so that corresponds to delta lambda of 0.1 angstrom I, I i hope you you are familiar with this unit angstrom it's 10 to the minus 8, 10 meters right uh, it's 0.1 nanometer so uh, so uh, so this is about uh, uh, point uh, so the the resolving power this is the of a typical astronomical spectrograph that responds to about 0.1 angstrom and typically you want to uh, when you uh, do uh, ensure that you do nyquist sampling that uh, the spectral res resolution element is sampled between two pixels so we use astronomers use a detector called a charge coupled device ccds uh, i hope you have heard of this so so if you want to uh, spread the spectral resolu resol uh, resolution element into two pixels you are uh, basically having a dispersion of 0.05 angstrom per pixel right and 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 this corresponds to a velocity resolution velocity per pixel of 2 to 3 kilometer per second per pixel but now look at what you have to measure to detect a planet it's 2 to 3 meter per second it's 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 three orders of magnitude uh, smaller now this is the technical challenge to so one must measure wavelength shift to a precision of uh, a thousandth of a pixel your your uh, the uh, picture element for a photo detector jupiter like planet 
to detect an earth like planet you had to measure the, the line shape uh, to a precision of uh, 1 to the 10000 uh, 100000th of a pixel uh, someone is uh, so there's some noise in the thing can you can, can you ask them to mute please yeah so so that's a technical challenge that's a difficulty uh, so typical pixel size of a stand now okay uh, am i am i audible now okay excellent can you hear me yeah yeah okay okay, okay so a typical uh, pixel size of uh, an astronomical uh, ccd or the charge coupled device is about 15 micrometers so to detect an earth like planet using the radial velocity technique we have to measure motions of the stellar lines to a fraction of a nanometer so that's really challenging, you know. So uh, the, the difficulty is that uh, uh, most general purpose astronomical spectrograph are not this stable. So you need the, need the spectrograph to be extremely stable to measure this kind of displacement of the line. But most of the astronomical spectrographs are not stable. Uh, so then uh, people came up with two di uh, different solutions. Uh, so uh, one is to keep uh, uh, absorption cell of some gas at the at the slit of the spectrograph so that the starlight will pass through this cell of gas and this gas will have produce its characteristic lines uh, so it will it will also follow the uh, the star the path of the starlight within the spectrograph so you can do relative precision you can get relative precision the second method is to remove the spectrograph altogether from the spec uh, the telescope and keep it in a very stabilized environment and and these two uh, uh, techniques were tried and uh, uh, so the first technique tried historically was the absorption spell, uh, cell spectroscopy uh, so the cell of gas typically of iogen and uh, hydrogen fluoride was placed in the path, uh, path of the starlight and so that you can track and calibrate all changes in the spectrograph so this technique was mastered by I mean really pioneered by this Canadian group of Bruce Campbell and Gordon Walker uh, see this is a this group's story is really tragic. I mean, these, these people had attained radial velocity precision required to detect planets uh, even in the 1980. They just missed it because they were looking at the wrong stars. If they had looked at, you know, now we know if they had looked at any of the 200 stars uh, within uh, uh, 25 parsec from us, they would have detected it because they had the precision. They were really truly pioneers uh, of this technique. Uh, then the other technique is stabilizing the spectrograph, removing it from the telescope and keeping it in a um, temperature controlled uh, evacuated room so that uh, the, the temperature, the, the spectrograph is extremely stable. And this was the technique used by the Nobel Prize winners, uh, Michel Mayer and Didier Quilos, uh, who eventually were successful in detecting the planet in 1995. Uh, what I show here, uh, is a radial velocity precision achieved by various groups okay uh, so uh, on the y-axis is the radial velocity precision uh, in the units of meter per second uh, for Jupiter you need about so Jupiter is 12 meter per second right uh, and, and 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 this is the year number the commissioning year when uh, when such radial velocity precision was achieved which year was achieved uh, so you see this is this is the Nobel Prize winning discovery this particular point that's in 1995 that way. but you you please look at this canadian group they had achieved that position in, in 1980 itself so it's it's just a pity that they were just looking at the wrong stars so they had mastered the technique by then anyway so this discovery in 1995 really ignited the field of exoplanets and it had such a profound impact uh, not only in the for exoplan but in the entire astrophysics and physics and even even in the public uh, imagination about exoplanets so in the field of astronomy astrophysics, it ushered in new detection techniques. So radial velocity technique was the first uh, technique used to detect planets. But then once after the discovery, several uh, different uh, detection techniques were discovered. I, we will go through some of them. And this provided uh, impetus or, or motivation or justification for several very productive space missions. Uh, NASA, ESA, and even uh, ISRO is jumping into the wagon. They, they're all planning space satellites to measure uh, or to detect and uh, study the properties of uh, extrasolar or exoplanets. Uh, so, so radial velocity, the, the, what are the different de detection techniques uh, that 
people employ these days. Uh, the radial velocity techniques, of course, was used for the, the first detection. Then in 2000, the year 2000, a, a method called transit method was uh, discovered or the first exoplanet using this technique was discovered. We will uh, take a closer look at what transit method is. Uh, then uh, several other uh, detection techniques. We will probably will not have time to go through all of them, uh, but I'll, I'll primarily be focusing on radial velocity technique and the transit method. And that is because 96% of the 4,000 odd exoplanets known are discovered by these two techniques. So other techniques are just catching up, just being, you know, so maybe 10 years from now, this statistics might change. Uh, so this first discovery also uh, paved way to various different space missions. Uh, I, I don't want to go through all of them, uh, uh, except to uh, highlight this Kepler mission by NASA. So this mission truly revolutionized uh, the field of exoplanets. It was launched in 2009 and, and this four year mission 2013 when the data uh, uh, started uh, arriving, uh, it, it really, uh, you know, the number of exoplanets exponentially increased. Uh, we will see that later in the talk. And I also want to highlight uh, that, you know, our own space agency, uh, ISRO is also planning an exoplanet mission called ExoWorld. This will be launched sometime in the year 2027 or 28. Uh, it's still in the initial design phase, uh, but, but this is certainly happening. So this would be a good time for some of the younger people to get into this field if you're truly interested. Okay, I said the, the, as I said, the first discovery resulted in several new detection techniques being developed. And let us look at uh, some of them uh, and I'll, mainly talk about uh, radial velocity and uh, transit method. So radial velocity technique we have just seen. So now let's look at the transit method. Uh, uh, let's look at this video. So transit method is uh, when the planet is going around the star, you see now, now if, the, if the orbit is perpendicular to a plane of line and the plane of sight and the, and, and the, and the, and the planet is moving across the stellar disk, the stellar uh, brightness will dip, right? So you, you say that you're monitoring the star using a telescope, okay? So let me play this video again. Say that you are uh, monitoring the star uh, using a telescope and then uh, see uh, what what will happen now. Uh, so for this, the, the orbit has to be slightly perpendicular to you. So you see, uh, now, now you, this, is the, this is the brightness from the star. When the planet moves across the star, that is the bright, it is blocking some part of the, uh, Starlight and it's the, the star, stellar brightness dips, and from this dip, uh, we can determine the radius of the planet. We won't be able to detect the uh, measure the uh, mass of the planet, but we can detect the radius of the planet. Uh, uh, so let me maybe uh, now. What if there are so? So this is, this tells you that what if there are two planets or two different planets, one with a smaller radius, other with a larger radius. What will happen? Let's see. So this is the planet with a larger radius and this is the planet with smaller radius. The larger radius planet, of course, will block more light. So the depth of the transit depth will be deeper, as you can see here. And the smaller planet, the depth will be smaller, right? So, so it's easier to detect larger planets using transit method, if everything else is the same, right? Because it will produce larger dip. I'll, I'll show this again, just to. So transit method is just, uh, you do photometry. You just um, keep observing the star uh, for you know for days or you know or so whatever. And then if there is a planet and if it moves across the stellar disk, your um, uh, stellar brightness will dip. And based on the depth of the uh, uh, transit, you can de determine the radius of the star. Uh, and this is because the, the depth transit depth is proportional to the uh, the uh, planet radius to that of the stellar radius. Now, what if there are multiple planets around the star? How will the transit light curve look like? Let us see. So there are three planets here and all of them have different radius also, right? Let us see how the, now watch the light curve here. Uh, now the first planet enters, it's dipping. And once the first planet leaves, it goes back to the, uh, normal uh, and then the second planet comes across it dips again even while the second planet is still there the third one comes in so you 
you see, you, so you can have, depending on the number of planets and their sizes and, the, and their orbital period, you can have all different kinds of, uh, of uh, light curve, but you can model this light curve and then extract information, really. So, uh, so this is what transit method does, and this is how it discovers exoplanets. So as I said, the transit depth depends on, is, uh, is directly proportional to uh, the radius of the planet and the radius of the star square. Uh, so stellar uh, radius also matters. So around a uh, smaller star, uh, you can detect a, a planet of same size much better than around a star of you know, uh, uh, larger radius. Okay, uh, moving on. Yeah, so uh, I want to highlight one particular thing here. Uh, so uh, look at uh, these two uh, methods, radial velocity and transit method. They account for 96% of the exoplanets discovered so far. And, and this is something that uh, you should keep in mind. And, and we will only discuss about these two methods in this talk. Uh, the other methods like microlensing, direct imaging, you can see only one or two percent of the uh, known planets. So, so here is the current status, okay? Current census of the planets. Uh, so, on the y-axis, what I am showing is the cumulative number of detection as a function of discovery year, right? 1995 was the first discovery. The red one. The red bars represent radial velocity, planets discovered via radial velocity technique, and the green ones via transit methods, and other colors are for other methods. Let's just focus on radial velocity and transit for the time being. Uh, you can see 1991, one planet, and then in the initial year, up to about 2012 or so, the num uh, radial velocity planets were more in number. But after 2013, you see the green bars are increasing. That's transit, and that is because Kepler data started coming in. So now, uh, as you saw in this uh, earlier figure, 77% uh, of the known exoplanets are detected through transit methods, and, and almost 60% of them are from Kepler satellite alone. Uh, and now we know of, uh, so this is as of 24 June, we know of around 4,171 uh, confirmed planets. And 4, 000, about 4,500 more candidates, which are yet to be confirmed. So there's, many of them will be confirmed soon. So this number is likely to go up rapidly. And this is the, the Kepler satellite, which, which, uh, you know, uh, which dramatically changed our understanding of uh, uh, about exoplanets or planetary systems in general. This was launched in 2009 uh, and uh, it, it uh, confirmed around 2,300 exoplanets and, uh, uh, and, and more than 2,000 exoplanets to be candidates to be confirmed. See, now we, since once we know more than 4,000 exoplanets or planetary systems, uh, it's possible now to carry out some demographic studies and try to uh, you know, ask certain questions or try to answer certain questions like, so, uh, uh, so we can, as, as I said, from the radial velocity technique, we can measure the mass of the planet, uncertain to the extent of the the, the uh, inclination or the the orbital uh, the orbital plane, how much how it is tilted to our uh, line of sight, because if it is exactly perpendicular to our line of sight, we will get the true mass. If it is slightly tilted, we will the mass that we get will be a minimum mass of the planet. But anyway, radial velocity gives you mass. Transit observations gives you the radius of the planet. And also the inclination angle, so that you can get the true mass. So if you observe a planet, uh, if you observe a planet uh, with both radial velocity and uh, 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 transit method, so somebody is uh, annotating the slide. So uh, could you please not do that? Yeah. yeah uh, okay. So 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 uh, so trans uh, radial velocity technique will give you the mass of the planet, or at least minimum mass of the planet, and uh, transit will give you the radius of the planet and both radial velocity and transit will give you the orbital period of the planet. So what we can measure about exoplanetary systems are three quantities, the mass, the radius, and the orbital period. How much time does it take to go around the host star, right? Okay. Now, once we have 
uh, 4,000 odd planets with uh, measured mass, radius, and orbital period, we can uh, try to uh, address the question or ask questions. Uh, how do these planetary systems look like? Do they look like our uh, solar system? Are their properties similar to our solar system? Uh, so which, what kind of planets are more common? Are, are Jupiter-like gas giant huge, the gas giant planets more common or Earth-like smaller planets, terrestrial rocky planets more common in the, in the universe? Or, or uh, you know, at what distance are they found? So, uh, you know, ex uh, do Jupiters, uh, all, are do Jupiters always found at 5 AU or 10 AU kind of distances or are they see also seen closer to the host star? So you can ask all these kind of questions and we are now in a position to answer these questions. And uh, we have in our group in TIFR have been uh, working on this and I will, in the, in the rest of the talk, I will uh, give you some basic results on this. Okay. So I'm going to summarize what, we, what have we learned so far in the last 25 years of our exoplanet study. I'm giving you the results right away. And I'll, in the rest of the talk, I'll explain to you how we arrived at these results. So these are the three main things that we have learned. The first one, planetary systems are ubiquitous. Planetary systems are very common in our galaxy or in the universe. Uh, in fact, there are more planets in our galaxy than stars. What this means is that every star in our galaxy have more than one planet on average. This we are able to say now uh, with 4,000 exoplanets known. See, you have to appreciate the importance of this result. Uh, uh, we are, uh, so you should also appreciate that we are a unique generation uh, uh, or we are perhaps the only generation uh, who is living with the definite knowledge that exoplanets exist, that planets around stars other than the sun exist. Generations before us did not have this knowledge. So we are the first generation to live with the definite knowledge that planets around other stars actually exist. But we can do, we know much more than that, not just that, that we also know that planetary systems are quite ubiquitous in the universe. And in fact, uh, every star in our galaxy, perhaps on average, hosts more than one planet. So this is a very profound uh, result. The second interesting result that we have learned in the last 25 years is that solar system, our solar system, is not a representative planetary system. Or in other words, all the, uh, the 4,000 exoplanetary systems that we have discovered uh, do not look like our solar system in observed properties or our system architecture. This has come as a shock to us. Third, our planet properties, the measured properties of the planet, namely the mass, the radius, and the orbital period, are somehow closely connected to the properties of the host star, the star which is hosting them. See, this is a very uh, interesting result. The, you don't expect this to happen. This needn't necessarily uh, be there. I mean, you can't, you, won't, you can't predict this. No physical theory predicts this. But this is what we observationally find. So it is almost as if the planets know, uh, planets know what uh, star it is being born around. Or somehow they preserve their memory from birth. So we will talk a little bit more about this later. So these are the three major results, major things that we have learned about exoplanetary systems. And in the rest of the talk, uh, how much time do I have? Uh, 10, 15 minutes? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so in the rest, uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to uh, tell you or convince you how we arrived at these results. The first is, of course, planetary systems are ubiquitous in the universe and there are more planets in our galaxy than stars. So how did we learn about it? Now to do this, we have to compute a, quality, a quantity called the uh, occurrence rate of exoplanets. Uh, occurrence rate is simply defined as the mean number of planets per star. You know, having properties, some properties like a you know, radius in a given range or orbital field in a given range. Uh, see, it's, uh, suppose if you had uh, you know, surveyed all the stars in our galaxy. And if you could also say that our survey will definitely tell us whether that star has a planet or not, or, you know, or even, even if it has multiple planets, we'll detect it. If that were the case, you have to just do this. 
you have to just uh, divide the number of plants detected div uh, by the number of stars surveyed. But unfortunately, we are only doing only a small patch of the sky, right? So, uh, so we are not uh, ob observing all the stars in our galaxy. But if you know, uh, so there are there are selection effects in our sample. There are observational biases. But if we can, if you know what they are, and if we can mathematically take care of them, we can actually correct for this completeness and and various other selection biases. And this is what we have done. So let me explain to you one such selection bias. So this is all from the Kepler data. So and Kepler uh, used the transit method to detect exoplanets, right? So what Kepler satellite did was it just stared at a piece of sky, uh, a 10 degree by 10 degree piece of sky for four years. The telescope just looked at that sky, at that piece of sky. So there will be the, the, there are several hundred thousand stars there, and if they have planets, they will go around them, and you will it will observe a dip. And not only that, it will if the orbital period of the planet was you know less, less than one year, let's say, and the Kepler mission for, was for four years, so it would detect uh, detect that dip three or four times, right? But then the problem is, so just imagine the transit thing, right? I mean, if I am the observer, or if you are the observer, and if the uh, planet is going around the star. Uh, if, if, it, if the orbit is exactly perpendicular to you, you will detect. But what if the orbit is uh, you know, parallel to you? So like the uh, planet is going around the star like this and you are there. So you will not uh, detect any, the planet will not uh, go across the stellar disk. So you have to correct for that geometry, right? So even if you, uh, let's say if the uh, Kepler looked at the piece of sky and even if Kepler, uh, Kepler do not detect any uh, transit depth or transit dip, it doesn't mean that that uh, star doesn't have a plan because it, it could also mean that it has a, its orbital period is uh, you know in the plane of the sky. So you have to correct for that geometric probability of transit, and then you have to also uh, even if a star transits, uh, what guarantee is that our our detector, our telescope, our instrument, and detector will detect it? So we need to understand the detector properties very well. So one can actually correct for this, and this is this we have done, and and one can find the occurrence rate. So occurrence rate is just simply the number of planets uh, per star, right? So you, once you do make all these uh, corrections, you can do that. And uh, this is what we find. Here, uh, what, I, what I show here is the occurrence rate per 100 stars, huh? number of planets per 100 stars. Uh, on the y-axis, it's occurrence rate per 100 stars. And on the x-axis, it's a planetary radius in the Earth radius unit, so this is uh, in in the in uh, planets with one to two Earth radius are called Earth-like planets. Planets with two to four Earth radius are called super Earth. See uh, the Neptune uh, in our solar system has four Earth ra Earth radius, so it's a it's an ice giant. So uh, radius between four to eight times the Earth radius are called ice giants, and and radius uh, greater than eight uh, Earth radius are called giants. See, Jupiter's radius is about 10 or 11 Earth radius, 11 times Earth radius. So they are called gas giants. So let me uh, also familiarize you with these terms a little bit. So these are the Earth-like planets, what we call in our solar system, right? Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. These are terrestrial planets. We call them terrestrial planets because they are rocky. The densities are high, average density is high. It's a rocky planet, but these are also smaller planets, less massive, smaller planets. These are the inner solar system planets. These are the ice giants, uh, Uranus and Neptune, right? Uh, so these are slight la larger than, these are not as big as Jupiter or Saturn. These are slightly smaller, but these are ice giants. Their atmospheres are mostly ice as water and methane ice. And these are the gas giants in our solar system, Jupiter. Uh, 11 times the Earth radius and 300 times the Earth mass. It's a giant planet, a massive planet. And Saturn, 100 times the Earth mass and 10 times the Earth radius. Massive planet. And, and what do we find in terms of occurrence rate? Let's see. Uh, this is occurrence rate for 100 uh, stars. I have written the numbers here. For 100 stars, there are around 57 Earth-like planets. About 60 super-Earth planets, between radius between 2 to 4. Earth radius, but only seven ice giants and, and, and roughly about seven gas giants. So giant planets like Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus and Neptune are fewer and smaller Earth-like and super-Earth-like planets are more common. 
among exosolar plants. Right? So smaller rocky plants are more abundant than gas giants by a factor of six or seven times. And if you collapse all this uh, radius and, and, and find out the total occurrence rate, irrespective of the radius and all that, if you don't subdivide them, then the total occurrence rate is about 1.3 planets per star. So every star in our galaxy have at least more than one planet around it. See, 1.3 is an average number. This doesn't mean that you can have 0.3 planet around a plan, uh, star, right? I mean, this is just an average number. So the average occurrence rate, that is number of planets around the star, on average is 1.3. And this is the basis of the statement that there are more planets in our galaxy than stars. Because there are, there's more than one planet per star, so there must be more planets in our galaxy than stars. See, this is, a, this is something that Kepler has uh, showed us, the Kepler legacy. Uh, it's only after Kepler satellite that we knew that there are more planets out there than stars. So that's about the first result. So I, I hope I have convinced you that planetary systems are common, ubiquitous, and uh, there, are, uh, there are more than one planet per star, and, and, and smaller planets are more common than gas giants. So the second important result that we learned, result that we learned uh, is this. Solar system, our solar system is not very really representative. It's not an archetypal planetary system. Uh, uh, or in other words, the, the exoplanetary systems uh, do not look like our solar system. So why do we say this? Uh, here I have a histogram, a, a distribution of a, a planet radius of 4,000 or here about 3,083 planet radius, right? Uh, observed radius of the planet. So I have also shown, and this is the, this is the frequency distribution, right? On the, on the y-axis, I have number of planets or frequency. I have also shown uh, the radius of Earth, Neptune, and Jupiter, just to orient you, you know, uh, with our solar system planets. So this is Earth, Earth radius, one. This is Neptune's radius, four. And there is Jupiter's radius, about 11 times the Earth radius. This is the unit of Earth radius. You see where the distribution is peaking. It is between that of Earth and Neptune. Right? See, in our solar system, we do not have a planet uh, which has radius and mass between that of Earth and Neptune. You have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and then it's Neptune. So uh, after the, uh, uh, so we do not have a planet with mass and radius in between that of Earth and Neptune. But most of the most common exoplanet seems to be this kind which has radius and mass in between that of Earth and Neptune. We now call this uh, such planet as super Earths or mini Neptunes. These are the most common type of planets in the universe, from as far as we can tell. So solar system, so it looks as if solar system does not have, have the most common planet in the universe that us often seen the universe. Now here is the distribution of orbital period how much time it takes a planet to go around the host star, right? I have shown the orbital period of Mercury here, which is 88 days. Mercury is the innermost planet in our solar system. And, and Earth, one year, right? 365 days. The orbital period is given in days here. You see again the distribution. Where is it peaking? Eight to 10 days. And Mercury, the innermost planet in our solar system, has 88 days orbital period. So most of the exoplanetary system that we have discovered are very compact systems. They are well within the orbit of Mercury. They are very close to their host star. So this has come as a surprise for us. And solar system is not like this. So it looks as if uh, 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 exoplanetary systems are, you know, in terms of uh, planetary properties and architecture, system architecture, the orbital distances, very different from a solar system. Uh, this scatter plot shows planet radius as a function of orbital period. Uh, and I was also shown as red, the red, the red uh, dots are solar system planets. And you can see most of them are within the uh, which are orbital period less than that of the, even the innermost uh, planets in our solar system. So this is, how, this is why we say our solar system does not look like an archetypal planetary system. It looks very different from the exoplanetary system that we have known. 
Now the last question. Shall you? How much time do I have? Yeah, you can take enough time. No problem. Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is the third result. Planet properties are closely connected to the host star properties. See, this perhaps is the most important result that I come out of the studies, and it's very profound uh, because this has important implications for planet for our understanding of planet formation, how planetary systems form, uh, etc. Now, uh, what do I mean when I say planet properties are closely connected to host star properties? I, I already explained the planet properties, exoplanet properties of the exoplanets that we can measure are radius, mass, and the orbital period or orbital distance. And 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 what are the host star properties that we are talking about? We are talking about the host star, star properties of effective temperature or the spectral type of the star. I hope you know what the spectral type or the effective temperature of the stars are. So if you look up in the sky in the night, you see stars in different colors, right? And that is because they have different temperatures, different surface temperatures. The hotter stars will look blue, the cooler stars will look red. Our sun looks greenish yellow, because that is in between uh, hot and cool, right? So it looks as if the, the, the properties of the planet are dependent on the the surface temperature of the star, what kind of star? See, the surface temperature or the, uh, uh, the spectral type of the star is also a proxy for the stellar mass. The cooler stars are low mass stars. Uh, and uh, uh, warm stars like sun are intermediate mass and hotter stars are more massive. So it looks as if uh, the, plan the kind of planets formed around low mass, intermediate mass, and more massive stars are also different. That's, that's one host star property, the T effective or the uh, effective temperature or surface temperature or the spectral time. The other property that we can measure, stellar property that we can measure is, okay, we'll, I'll come to that when I talk about it. So the first we look at how our planet properties are uh, related to the, the surface temperature or the mass of the star, okay? So this is what I was saying. Uh, the temperature, surface temperature and the colors are related. So we will only talk about uh, stars in this uh, surface temperature range. So stars with temperatures around 2000 to 3500 Kelvin are typically called M type. This is the spectral type. These are, these are the coolest stars in our galaxy. A slightly red orange type are slightly warmer, 3500 Kelvin to 5000 Kelvin. They are called K type stars. And these are sun-like stars. Sun is a G type star. Sun's uh, effective temperature is around 5800 Kelvin. Between 5000 and 6000 K are called sun like stars. These are yellowish stars. And F type stars have uh, surface temperatures uh, in the range of 6000 Kelvin to 7500 Kelvin. Let us see how, what kind of planets each of these, each of these stars have, spectral types have. Here it is. Again, I have shown the occurrence rate per 100 stars and the numbers I have written here. So, Cooler stars, the M-type stars, the cooler stars appear to have more planets. So almost uh, two planets per star for cooler stars. This is occurrence rate per 100 stars. So there are 200 planets per 100 M-type stars. These are the cooler stars. And that number decreases steadily going from M-type to K-type to G-type to finally the hottest star, F-type. Around a F-type star uh, or more massive star, there are only 77 planets per 100 stars. Or or 0.7 planet per star. So, so what this is telling you is that cooler stars host more planets and hotter stars have fewer planets. Or low mass stars host more planets and uh, uh, more massive stars host fewer planets. But what kind of planets they host? Let us also, also ask that question, right? Uh, so here I've shown uh, the occurrence rate as a function of planetary radius, and the color bars now indicate the star type, spectral type. The red is M type, uh, green is K type, blue is G type, and purple is F type, the hottest star. M is the coolest star. So you see M type stars, the red bar is the highest for smaller planets, Earth-like planets, and uh, super Earths and mini Neptune kind of, kind of planets, smaller planets. But there are no giant planets, Saturns or Jupiters around uh, M-type stars, right? Uh, whereas uh, hotter uh, or sun-like uh, G-type and F-type stars have fewer smaller planets, 
but they have uh, they also host giant planets so cooler stars they they host more planets but most of their planets are smaller planets right cooler stars host more smaller planets most they 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 host more number of planets but most of them are smaller earth like rocky planets where I, but they do not cooler stars like m type stars do not host giant grow jupiter like planets this is one of the interesting results that have come out of this now the last uh, result i want to talk about uh, is uh, how planet properties depend on uh, uh, a stellar property called metallicity uh, I, i'm sure you know uh, you many of you are not familiar with this term metallicity see what astronomers we mean by metallicity is the following you know the from stars we can uh, from the stellar spectra we can actually measure uh, the elemental abundance of the star what i mean is you can measure how much hydrogen how much helium how much iron how much uh, you know oxygen carbon are, is there in the star by observing the stellar spectra right now astronomers uh, call anything other than hydrogen and helium as metals and there is a good reason for that uh see the most abundant element in the universe is hydrogen right so 72% of the universe by mass is hydrogen 26% is helium rest of the elements are only 2% so astronomers call this 2% as metals you know and when i say metallicity stellar metallicity what is, what i mean is the metal content the heavy element content of the star the amount of uh, elements other than hydrogen and helium in that uh, star is that clear okay and it it is this this uh, result came as a big surprise for us and uh, and and in fact uh, this is one of the observationally most robust result among exoplanets we found that planet uh, mass and radius have a strong dependence on the metal, heavy element content of the star central star so the 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 relation is like this so if you measure see we 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 measure metallicity uh, as a ratio of iron to that of hydrogen uh, iron is uh, a heavy element so we just this is just a, a proxy so just go by so higher this value higher the metal metal content or higher the heavy element content okay so when we measure this we find something very interesting uh, uh, stars with giant planets that is jupiter and saturn like planets uh, have higher metallicity highest metallicity than stars with smaller planets earth like planets that, uh, and and stars with no planets have even lower metallicity so in other words the the host star the metal heavy element content of the host star increases when going from stars with no planets with uh, stars with uh, small planets to stars with giant planets right so this is the result and and here what i what i have shown here is the on, on the horizontal axis the radius of the planet and uh, on the vertical axis average metallicity of the host stars hosting them so going from uh, one earth radius to uh, uh, giant planets jupiter like radius the metallicity increases the host star metallicity gradually increases so we were one of the first ones to point this out in a paper published in 2018 uh, i i and along with my student uh, we were the uh, one of the first few people to point this out to everyone uh, yeah so this is a, a normalized occurrence rate it's a little difficult to explain but i'll just uh, point out look at these bars uh, the green bar is uh, sun like metallicity okay if the heavy element content of that star is similar to that of the sun then that is represented by the green one and the blue one is super solar metallicity stars with metallicity or heavy element content higher than that of the sun and the and the red one is uh, stars with heavy element content less than that of the sun sub solar metallicity uh, so uh, you what you see is if you just look at the giant planets giant planets there are very few uh, sub solar metallicity stars with giant planets most of the giant planets are found around super solar metallicity uh, stars the green ones the giant planets are mostly found around the green ones you can see going smaller planets can be found around low metallicity stars also they don't care 
But to form a Jupiter-like planet, you need the metallicity content of the uh, star to be high. So we found even something even more interesting uh, in our paper, which we published. So the metallicity increases. Uh, so going from Earth-like planet to Jupiter-like planet, the metallicity of the whole star increases. You need higher metallicity to, to form Jupiter-like planet. But something interesting happens after about four Jupiter mass or so. So there are planets called super Jupiters, uh, planets which are more massive than, uh, than Jupiters. For them, the metallicity actually starts dropping. To form a super Jupiter-like planet, you don't need a higher metallicity. Only to form, so the metallicity of the host have peaks around Jupiter mass, one to four Jupiter mass. Beyond about four Jupiter mass, it, it actually drops. This, this came to us as a real surprise. We were the first one to point out, okay, okay there was this paper just before us. But this was a really uh, interesting surprise. Uh, so that is all I, have, I, I will discuss today. So I will see, uh, I have just given you these results. And, and, uh, but I have not explained why we uh, see this. What does this mean? What, the, what do these results mean? Uh, I think I, will, I can take this up in the discussions if there are questions. Why do we find Jupiter-like plants only around metal-rich stars and not, not around metal-poor stars and, and things like that? Uh, uh, so uh, maybe uh, I will just summarize and stop here and then take questions. We can have discussions and, 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 and during the discussion we can address some of these. Uh, implications of this research. So what, what have we learned so far in the last 25 years? Uh, we have learned that planetary systems are quite common. Solar system is not the only planetary system around. Uh, planetary systems are quite common. And uh, uh, there, are, uh, there are around uh, more than one planet per star in our galaxy on average. So, or in other words, there are more planets in, than stars in our galaxy. We have also seen that there are more smaller planets than gas giants. The, the, so the, the smaller planets are uh, something like seven to eight times larger in number than giant planets like Jupiter's. So giant planets are difficult to form. They are rarer. And there are more planets around cooler M-type stars than sun-like stars. The cooler stars, stars cooler than sun, host more planets. And most of them are smaller planets. They don't uh, uh, host giant planets. The second important result that we have learned is solar system is not an archetypal planetary system. Uh, solar system, we say this because solar system uh, do not, does not have the most common planet in the universe, which is a super Earth or a mini Neptune, which has a radius and mass in between that of Earth and Neptune, right? Uh, and the architecture or the orbital distance, or most of the exoplanetary system that we have discovered are very compact. All those plants are very close to the central star, uh, unlike solar system. So solar system uh, at the moment does not look like an archetypal or representative planetary system. Uh, and the third uh, result that we have learned is that planet properties, that is observable plant properties such as radius, mass, and orbital period, are strongly dependent on the properties of the stars that are hosting them. Uh, namely, uh, we looked at the T effect or the surface temperature or the spectral type or the metallicity. There is also an age dependence. If we have time, we can, uh, I can show some of those results. So what do we find? The larger and more uh, massive planets are preferentially found around metal rich stars. Cooler stars host fewer giant planets, but host many more smaller planets like suns, uh, than sun-like stars. See, these results have important implications for plant formation theories, and, and I want to end at that note. Uh, so this, I have not explained to you uh, uh, what this means. We can talk a little more, bit more about it, but, but uh, let me uh, just say uh, that uh, the fact that planets uh, show strong relation with the host star properties, planet properties are strongly related to the host star properties, what that, what is the, what, what that tells us is that Planetary systems somehow uh, preserve their memory from their birth. That is because uh, these correlations uh, reflect certain physical properties or certain correlations during their birth. Uh, so 
and that is why this these results have important implications for how these planetary systems form so i'm going to stop here and uh, and i can take questions now uh, thank you thank you sir the... thank you sir that was a uh, well explained wonderful presentation uh, now we can uh, discuss about few questions yeah yeah sure uh, uh, first i will ask a question uh, out of these uh, exoplanets uh is there any classification of uh, habitable exoplanets like ah uh, uh, so there are, i didn't talk about those see there are but uh, see the thing is uh, the definition of habitable is a little tricky uh, at the moment the working definition is uh uh planets uh, at at a certain distance from the star or planets uh, uh, see the te the temperature of the planets depends on the distance from the central star right the the central starlight and then it comes it just come to equilibrium so the hab the definition of the habitable zone is where the uh, the temperature is uh, uh, optimal enough to have water in liquid form that's the definition of habitable zone. so so in on earth uh, if the pressure conditions is like uh, if an exoplanet has an uh, atmosphere similar to that of earth that would mean Uh, the temperature has to be something like 300 kelvin or 25 degrees celsius or something but this is a tricky thing uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, yeah see it's not an easy thing to uh, describe that is why i i didn't talk about the habitable right? but then uh, using various uh, stringent conditions uh, now we know of around two dozen have uh, exoplanets at habitable zone earth like ah uh, also when we say habitable planets uh, it has to be earth like somewhat similar to earth in size and uh, mass so uh, i think uh, a statement can be made that we know of around two dozen about 20 25 uh, planets which can be considered as habitable but these are candidates we need to uh, uh, study uh, them a little bit more to confirm yeah thank you sir another is uh, uh, suppose in the case of binary stars how these uh, planets are uh, planets yeah yeah are so the, that's an interesting question yes uh, there are we know of planets around binary stars see i didn't have time to show you all that so kepler has discovered a few uh, stars about uh, around binary stars i need to check the number number i don't remember off on the of the top of my head but uh, i can i can provide you that number there are a few Uh, that have been discussed. So, so just imagine, sun is on such a planet. There will be two suns in the sky, on the sky, right? I mean, so it will be amazing, right? So there are all kinds of so the diversity in the exoplanet system is amazing, and uh, it's it's uh, it's far greater than what we could could have possibly imagined. Yeah. okay thank you sir now there are a lot of questions uh, uh, people are more interested because this is a very interesting topic but uh, due to uh, lack of time we are winding up the webinar uh, you can uh, later interact with uh, dr manoj you can sir no, shaj if you want i can i can take a few more questions i have you know 10 15 more minutes i can stay back it's okay if you if you okay, want okay 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 yeah can you uh, pick up from the chat box Oh, uh, or, I, or I can, I can pick. Ah, uh, no, I can, I can, I can. Such so a should I start? Uh, is the chat question? box? Ah, chat, chat box, I know. But ah, uh, twelve uh, fourteen. Oh, I should start from the beginning. Okay. Ah, uh, I am looking at them. Okay, okay. Mm. One is metallicity is high uh, means. Oh, let me. I'm. I'm trying. Starting from the beginning. Yeah. so okay. are the are the, yeah this is a question from sana siad uh, are the exoplanets also ordered near to star rocky and far from star gaseous like our solar system uh, uh, sana the answer to that question is no not necessarily so we have systems where you have uh, jupiters at point 1 au or point 0 1 au mercury is at uh, point 3 au so we have jupiters gas giants very close to the star uh, so uh, this ordering is not necessary that uh, relative distance and and you can imagine one consequence of this is you imagine jupiter at very close to the star and it is irradiated by the stellar radiation so we have found a bunch of jupiters which are inflated it's it's it's, it's radius is much larger than what we would uh, 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 anticipate or expect uh, theoretically 
So these are called inflated Jupiters or bloated up Jupiters. So we have such system. So that to answer to your question is uh, no, there is no such ordering. That is not what we are finding. Uh, next from Aparna, uh, question from Aparna, how, how probably is the exoplanets uh, discovered have more elliptical orbit unlike the case in the solar system? Uh, also, there have there been solar discovered in Jupiter's exoplanet near the star? Yeah, yes, yes. So this is uh, not, uh, I'm not very sure about the smaller planets in the outer region. Jupiter's size planets, so these, uh, there are plenty of systems with Jupiter is very close to the star. Such systems are called hot Jupiters. Such planets are called hot Jupiters because, first of all, their temperature will be um, much higher because they are very close to the uh, star. And uh, about your question, Abarna, about uh, eccentricity, uh, the elliptical orbit, which means, yeah, so we have, we have, we know of uh, Jupiter like planets with high eccentricity, not non circular orbits. Next is from Hari Patmam. To what extent is it correct that the mass of the Earth is a constant? I think this is not related to this term. Uh, uh, in transit method, uh, so this is from Prachi Chavan. In transit method, what if there's an object like an asteroid passing between? So as I said, the, the transition depth is a ratio of the uh, radius of the object to that of the star. So the larger the radius, uh, more the dip. So asteroids are very small. So if it is detectable, we can see. See, we can model it and find out the radius. And we will know if, if it is less than, uh, you know, I know 0.01 Earth radius, it's, it's not a, a hydrostatic equilibrium body, so it's not a planet. Uh, so next uh, is uh, uh, binary stars, the question is asked. Uh, so now let me go towards the end. I picked up a few from the top. Uh, if, uh, so this is from Samira Ahmed. If you could share with us your research paper, which talks about, yeah, I can do that. I can send a link to Shaju or Sudhir. Uh, this is uh, Sarala Shanti Mols. Oh, oh no, so this is just a, this is not a question. And uh, huh, there is a question from Aparna. The metallicity is high means there could be higher ion content. Yes. Doesn't it mean that? Uh, yes, that is exactly that it means, uh, Aparna. So what it means is that, so the way we understand this result, that uh, Jupiter-like planets or the gas chains are formed only around uh, metal-rich stars. Uh, the way we understand it, it's not a settled issue, but the way we understand it is both the star and the planetary system are formed from the same molecular cloud. So it has a high, it has higher metallicity. And see, the, the crucial thing is the following. In the standard planet formation scenario, which we are, uh, call the core accretion scenario, before forming Jupiter, you have to first form a 10 to uh, 5 to 10. Uh, 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 so you have to, you have to uh, form a first, first form a 10 to 15 Earth mass core, a rocky core, and then accrete gas from the disk. See, uh, this is something I wanted to just show. Uh, can I share this again and just show that? See, we believe planets are formed. Uh, uh, in this disk. So we are now able to actually see so these are protoplanetary disks. See, uh, planets are formed in the disk around stars, which are called protoplanetary disks. Now we have observed this is actual data. Uh, so you see a protoplanetary disk, you see this in the dust emission, you actually see planets forming. You know? Uh, so you see, when you observe protoplanetary disks around young stars, you see all kinds of structures in this disk. These gaps and holes are caused by Jupiter like planets forming in this disk. So to answer uh, Aparna's question, uh, uh, when these uh, planets form in this disk, uh, uh, first for, to form a Jupiter, you have to first form a rocky core, Earth-like rocky core, 10 to 15 Earth mass core. Now, uh, these are these, uh, to form dust, dust are silicates, right? Iron or magnesium silicates. So to form this rock, rocky core, you need heavy elements. So if, you, if your met initial metallicity is high, if you have more heavy elements, it's easier to form this rocky core from, then you can accrete gas around it and form Jupiter. So it's for Jupiter-like planet to form, you, that is why you need higher metallicity to form Jupiter-like planets. Whereas, uh, uh, but then it's surprising that for smaller planets, you don't need that kind of metallicity because the Jupiter's core is around 10 to 20 Earth mass, 10 to 15 Earth mass. So there's a lot of rocky uh, heavy element needed there. So you're right. So uh, that is how we, we explained that. Uh, so the next question, 
so let me ask one question dr manoj yes please. Uh, uh, as you you are specialist in star formation how this uh, dust in the uh, dust is actually uniformly or non uniformly distributed in the space how this uh, center of uh, stars uh, begin to start that is yeah, the, yeah. so i uh, let me critical uh, yeah critical start beginning of the point center of the mass center of the stars uh oh what am i doing yeah so let me let me let me show you how stars form this is a, this is our our this is a cartoon this is not the actual thing this is a cartoon of how we think stars form uh stars are formed from the molecular clouds and and when the once a molecular cloud core uh, collapses start collapsing under its own gravity uh, you form a central protostar a disk around it and a, a overlying envelope from which the material is draining round down to the disk the disk forms because uh, of angular momentum conservation see that this is the rotation axis of the whole thing the whole cloud was rotating and and material which was far away from the and uh, rotation axis of the uh, the system will have higher angular momentum so they cannot directly collapse onto the central star they have to so you just imagine something which is rotating and collapsing it will form a flattened structure if you have seen how how they make romari roti you will uh, understand that uh, so so you form a disk so most of the material that goes on to build the star must be processed through the disk so eventually the envelope dissipates away either by draining on to the disk or by uh, you know disp uh, dispersion you and then you will reach this stage uh, called a, a pre main sequence phase or where you have a central star and the protoplanetary disk around it and these protoplanetary disks are the birthplace of planetary systems okay uh, that, that that's all after the beginning of star my question is uh, what is the crucial uh, point factors uh, deciding the center of the stars which factor actually no, no star has uh, not formed yet here this is still not one are you talk is your question about the molecular clouds whether there is dust in yeah, the molecular yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so yeah. so molecular gas and dust are well mixed okay so so molecular clouds have uh, no gas content and then dust content and it's a roughly the mass ratio is gas to dust mass ratio is 100 there is 100 times more gas than dust in in mass okay when it collapses i mean which factor decides the center of the star that is the question center means what see this is a proto star this is the star is not burning hydrogen yet you know so this is, a, this is they are just uh, contracting hydrostatically so so when it collapses under gravity first it forms a central hydrostatic core then the higher angular momentum forms a disk around it and yeah, and yeah. this is Thank this you. center and this central hydrostatic core grows by accreting material from the disk onto the star and and yeah. and, and it is from the disk which is which is again gas and dust disk it is from this disk that the planetary system forms okay okay thank you thank you yeah is is there any question other questions uh or yeah so maybe one final question the last okay. question from kevin chako are stars with low metallicity new year stars ha huh. so that's an interesting question no stars with low metallicity are older stars stars with higher metallicity are new year stars uh, so that is something that we have recent our recent work uh, actually shows that uh, so you we just uh, learn that jupiter like planets uh are formed around the metal rich stars right so metal rich stars are younger stars they are formed in the see our galaxy is about more than 13 billion years old 13 giga years old and uh, uh, and then uh, metal rich star solar system is only 5 giga years old and the metal rich uh, stars are typically around sun, uh, uh, the age of sun 5 giga years or so so uh, one of our studies have actually shown that uh, uh, just look at the age bar here uh, the the jupiter like planet this is planet mass the massive planets are younger actually compared to low mass planets so the, i think this may be connected to the fact that metal rich stars are younger as well so that's the answer to your question kevin okay shall we wind up yeah yeah okay okay uh, that was a very wonderful session dr manoj uh, students uh, participants you can later contact manoj uh, through the website of tifr you can see his name and email id 
you can communicate with or shall you you can you can share my email id with them if you you have my email id right so they are welcome yeah, yeah, to yeah. so i encourage students to write to me if they are interested and if you want they want to uh, work on some of this stuff especially okay. the senior graduate students and master students yeah 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 don't call him because he's very busy person only you can, you can write, write to me write to me if you want so yeah whatsapp or email him he will respond uh, he is a very uh, serving humanity person you want to serve the society especially the <laughs> academic community now we will wind up this webinar it was a huge participation now i invite dr sudhir sebastian the convener of the program to propose the vote of thanks over to sudhir Okay, I think I am audible. Yeah, audible. Okay. Good afternoon, all. I deem it a great honor and privilege to propose vote of thanks on this uh, memorable occasion of the third Diamond Jubilee webinar uh, organized by the Department of Physics. First of all, I would like to express our very sincere thanks to the speaker of today's webinar. Professor Manoj Ravangara for a very interesting and engaging session on exoplanets and uh, introducing us to the most recent research happening in this area. I am sure uh, your talk has inspired many of our participants to do further work and explore uh, the this area. So, on behalf of all participants and on behalf of the Department of Physics. i thank you once again for accepting our invitation and giving us a wonderful talk thank you professor manoj thank you all thank you for your time thank you for inviting me and, and and to all the participants sir uh, thanks for listening to me uh, write to me if you uh, uh, are interested we can uh, keep the conversation going okay. thanks now i would like to express heartfelt thanks to our beloved principal reverend father jolly andrews who is uh, also a faculty of the department uh, of the physics and a good researcher himself for the help support and encouragement extended in organizing this webinar thank you father thank you it's excellent dr manoj okay thank you thank you very much okay uh, i would like thank to thank you for inviting me yes uh, now i would like to convey my special thanks and appreciation to the vice principal of the college and the head of the department of physics dr k y shaju who is uh, taking keen interest uh, and uh, quite a lot of effort to conduct this diamond jubilee webinar series giving us an opportunity wonderful opportunity to interact with experts in different areas from different parts of the globe thank you sir now thank you now i express my sincere thanks to all my colleagues especially executive uh, committee members uh, dr xavier joseph and devin jos for the help and support in organizing this uh, webinar and special thanks to jos sanni our uh, assistant also for preparing the feedback form and making all arrangements to send the participation certificate thanks to our student and next joshi for designing the brochure and other publication materials of this webinar last but not least i express my gratitude to all the participants for being with us and supporting us to make this webinar a very successful and fruitful event once again thanking you all i can go thank you thank you thank you dr manoj thank you everybody thank you thank you thank you to us a, a nice session all right. wonderful okay. thank you thank you thank you all all right okay so so uh, so shall you can if the students are interested uh, please give them my email id pass yeah, on yeah, yeah. i will ID. i will i will type yeah, it here and they can ask them to write uh, write to me okay 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 okay, okay. all right uh, okay. Th uh, thank you sudhir thank you, thank you. and uh, yeah i'll uh, talk to you later hmm? okay thank bye. you bye bye everyone yeah, i will come back okay So his email is yampuravangara. 
എം പുറവങ്കര അറ്റ് ജിമെയിൽ ഡോട്ട് കോം താങ്ക് യു താങ്ക് യു ഓൾ ബൈ